Okay, picking up part two of the containment timeline. Uh, picking up in November 1950, as the Korean War is raging and people's volunteers have been sent into Korea by Chairman Mao. So they start streaming down across the border from China in their hundreds of thousands. And by the time we get to January 1951, they have recrossed, pushing the UN and US troops back. They've recrossed that crucial boundary, the 38th parallel that separated North and South before the war started. Um, and the communists are in the ascendancy again. It's at this time that MacArthur starts to threaten the use of nuclear weapons to turn back the communist threat. Uh, that would escalate the conflict too far for those same people. So in April 1951, he's sacked by President Truman, replaced by General Omar Bradley. Um, you don't need to know that though. And uh, the war is, is far from over, but uh, you're going to get a stabilisation around about the 38th parallel um, by June 1951, where the fighting ends up not really moving too far away, having seesawed back and forth from that area uh, in the first year or so of the war. That fighting is going to continue for another two years, but in June 51, you get a stabilisation of the fighting and you get the beginning of peace talks. A bit more of a stalemate around that area. You get peace talks beginning, but you're going to have two more years of bitter fighting and warfare in some horrific conditions. We've got bloody cold out in Korea for the American soldiers. That went for everybody else as well. So you can see the war beginning to wind up, it's the fighting still raging. By the time you get to, um, yeah, we don't need the map anymore. Two events in the next couple of years really help to bring the war to a conclusion. In 1952, you get the election of American President, former General, they call him Ike, Dwight D. Eisenhower. A hugely respected man from uh, the Second World War who said go for D-Day and was the supreme leader of the Allied forces in Europe. And he got elected on the promise of saying, I will go to Korea, which the American people uh, heard to me. He was going to try and end the war there. And certainly, um, he didn't want another bloody conflict on his hands. If you tie that in as well, in 1953, in March, with the death of Uncle Joe himself, he's replaced by less hardline communists, not immediately Khrushchev, but eventually Khrushchev, um, and he was a big stumbling block to any peace between uh, the East and the West in those years. So these two events combined helped to bring about uh, a desire for the end of the war, and you are going to see in July 53 an armistice, not a peace treaty. Technically, the Korean War was still going on. You get the militarised zone set up almost identically to the 38th parallel. Uh, the border has barely moved in favour of either north or the south, and it's gone a tiny bit northwards. Um, that was all the way back in 1953. The, technically, the war rumbles on in one of the most tense spots in the world. You must be able at this stage to give a judgment on the success of containment. Very common 10 mark question. You could easily get a 10 mark question about how big a threat the Korean War was to world peace and escalating into a, a more of a global conflict. Could be a 10 mark question. You could easily get an entire four, six and 10 on Korea, even though it's the smallest of the three topics on containment. Um, make sure you know your Korean War. Uh, and make sure you talk about the consequences of that war. So moving into the 50s might be an idea if you talk about some sort of general ideas in the Cold War, we don't study it in quite as much detail in this, this period of the 50s, but you could talk about the deepening of the Cold War in the 1950s over the course of the next seven or so years after 53, well, that had already been happening. You've got the continuing arms race that is eventually going to develop into mutually assured destruction. Mad 
allegedly the, they had enough nuclear power between them, the two superpowers, to destroy the world ten times over. Um, that was greatly aided by the fact that in '52 the Americans got the H bomb, the Soviets got it in '53 as well, um, and then you got a widening of the Cold War in other ways, where by the time you get down to 1957. You've got intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, that could travel from the Soviet Union to America, across the top of the world, across the Arctic, um, bringing an even greater threat. You didn't even have to have bombers or submarines to launch those missiles for you. And then in 57 as well, you had the launch of Sputnik. As I'm sure you all know, the, the Russian satellite, the first Russian satellite in, in orbit, well, any satellite in orbit, and the Americans have become scared that they're going to weaponize space. So you have a deepening Cold War in the 1950s, um, and our next key event is going to kick off in uh, really the early 60s, but we're just looking at the background here. There are a few things to, to mention within that sort of period of the deepening Cold War. This one's a Vietnam one in 1954. Having given aid to the French, 500 million a year since 49, the Americans are forced to reevaluate their, their policy on Vietnam when the French finally get defeated at Dien Bien Phu by the forces of the Viet Minh and those battling for Vietnamese independence. They pull out in a humiliation and it leads to the Geneva Accords. where the country is temporarily, again, same at the very soon of the Korea, divided along the lines of the 17th parallel with the North and Ho Chi Minh being run by the Communists, the South allegedly being run by the, a democratic anti-communist regime. Um, this, is, this is Ho Chi Minh up in the North. This is Ngo, Ngo Dim Diem, D I E M, in the south, who takes over in 55. Uh, pretty horrific. A Catholic man uh, who basically abused his power, gave loads of powerful jobs to his, his family, and was deeply protested against by the Buddhist majority in South Vietnam. The Americans couldn't find anything better, and he was anti communist, so they, they were absolutely fine with him, um, supporting, propping up brutal regimes throughout history, particularly in this, this period of the Cold War. Those Geneva Accords said that free elections would take place to unite the country in the future. And uh, as a spooky echo of what happened in Eastern Europe and perhaps a little bit of the touch of the hypocrisy from the Americans, those elections never took place. The Americans would let them happen in the South because they thought the communists would win about 80% of the vote and there was no way they were going to have that happen on their watch. Um, so by 55, Eisenhower escalates American involvement. He starts putting American bodies in there. Right there. 1955, you get the first advisors. Not supposed to be combat troops. Uh, you do get American casualties in the 50s um, as collateral damage, but they're not supposed to be in the front line firing their weapons. It's supposed to just be their training and advising the, the South Vietnamese troops. They try and back the force of the communism. They're sent in 55, um, and again, just make sure you can always argue, you can always explain why is there that increasing involvement from the United States in Vietnam? One of the reasons is that the French pulled out, and the French were um, a colonial power who were not going to take a communist regime, they were battling the communists, so the Americans had to step in and try and do the job. By 56, switching over to Cuba, I think it's the first event we've had on Cuba. This is when the socialist revolutionary, your friend and mine, Fidel Castro, starts his guerrilla campaign. Notice the spelling, it's G-U-E-R-R-I-L-L-A, -L -L little war, against the forces of Fulgencio Batista. He's a general. Ringing some bells with Vietnam here. He's anti-communist, he's hardline, he runs a brutal military dictatorship, but as long as he's anti-communist, he's all right with the Americans. Um, and the Americans have had a fairly good relationship with him. You need to understand, when you get onto Cuba, be a good six-mark question, 
Why was Cuba important to the United States of America? You talk about how close it is, the proximity. It's only 90 miles away from Florida. You talk about the historic relationship. They um, helped the Cubans win their independence from Spain back in the 1890s. But the economic relationship, talk about geography, talk about history, talk about economics, where the Americans used to call um, Havana, the Cuban capital, uh, America's playground. Those mafia bosses would go down there and enjoy the weekend. People would go and gamble in the casinos. They had lots of businesses and hotels there. And lots of American agricultural businesses had land in Cuba. Uh, so they felt it was almost like a 51st state for them. And, and you can also talk about uh, the strategic benefits of Cuba for the Americans. They do still have a military base, Guantanamo Bay, very famously. Um, on the southern side of the island, which is technically American soil on um, the Cuban island. So Cuba is a very important place for, um, for the Americans and they were going to have a big interest in what was going on there. Um, we've already talked about 57 and the escalation of the Cold War with ICBM and Sputnik. We've got nothing for 58. So we're jumping to 1959. Uh, this is when Castro was successful. He took Havana. Uh, he toppled Batista with his socialist revolution, never called himself a communist, only ever a socialist, Castro, um, and immediately began to revolutionise what was going on in Cuba. Some of his immediate acts were to nationalise the land, to give it to the peasants, to try and make peasants' lives better. There's some horrific things as well, Castro, and uh, ran lots of Cubans, uh, elite Cubans and Cuban business owners and people who worked for the previous government out of the country and brutalised lots of people. Um, lots of those American businesses are losing land there. Over the course of the next year or so, he also nationalised, took over from the government businesses. Good example being American oil giant Texaco. Americans are losing out in Cuba. They're not particularly happy about this. So you're going to see a reaction from the Americans. 1960, what's really important to the Cuban economy? Sugar. And the Americans say, in the summer of 1960, we are not going to buy any more Cuban sugar. That's going to hit the, um, the Cubans hard economically and maybe make them rethink this, this socialist revolution. Later, in 1960, they banned all trade with Cuba and Cuban relied upon American dollars hugely, so they had to go looking elsewhere. Who's going to take a little sneaky bit of interest in um, this beacon of communism in the Western Hemisphere, the only one out there? Well, that's going to be uh, everyone's favourite former communist leader, Nikita Khrushchev. And he's going to sign a trade deal with Castro. He's going to try and bring them into the Soviet bosom. He's going to give them oil. He's going to give them machinery in exchange for Cuban sugar. He's going to give economic aid to the tune of 100 million. And why you might ask why America was important, uh, Cuba was important to America, you could easily get a question why was it important to the Soviets? Um, make sure you know that. And you could argue what Khrushchev hopes to gain from that. So you've got them increasingly being uh, snuggled up to the Soviet Union, and the Americans are going to respond again with their CIA plots that developed almost as soon as Castro comes to power. They thought about an exploding cigar to, um, to kill him. They talked about spraying LSD into a TV studio just to make him look stupid and damage his credibility. Um, there were some acts of sabotage on Cuban land, burning crops as well. And the most famous of them, obviously, um, is the, the planned invasion, which is going to happen in the next year. But you've got a new president who's elected in November 1960, takes over in 61, and one of his first acts in January was to break off all diplomatic relations with Cuba. And that stood for a very, very long time, actually, for the Americans. Um, and then you're going to get to April 1961, and that is when the inherited plan of the Bay of Pigs invasion is going to blow up in Kennedy's face, and we'll deal with that one in the next part.